Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making the headlines with political journalist at the Financial Times, Jasmine Cameron Chileshi, and assistant comment editor at The Telegraph, Olivia Utley. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. So let's see what's on some of those front pages now. The closure of some petrol stations because of a shortage of tanker drivers is the top story in the eye, which says fuel rationing could be on the way. The Telegraph says the situation is causing alarm and raises the spectre of panic buying by motorists. That's also the main story in The Guardian. While The Mail says the country is running on empty. As does The Sun. But The Times says Downing Street's message is one of don't panic. The Metro leads with the arrest of a man in connection with the murder of Sabina Nessa and pictures of another man police want to trace. The Financial Times goes with the Bank of England's forecast that inflation could hit 4% or higher next year, uh, by next year, although it is holding interest rates unchanged at the moment. While well, the Star brings us news that one farm is offering £30 an hour for people to pick its cabbages, apparently because it can't get enough pickers from abroad. And we're joined tonight by Jasmine Cameron Chileshi and Olivia Utley. Evening to both of you. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, so we're going to start with the latest on uh, supply chain issues at uh, the front of the eye, Jasmine. Uh, fuel being rationed at some petrol stations, BP, Esso and Tesco affected so far. Mm. So essentially, some of um, you know, some of these companies have warned that there could be potential fuel shortages. Um, so it's basically been caused by a shortage of drivers. Um, now this has been a problem that's been looming for a long time. There were fit, there were concerns that post Brexit we'd see a shortage of drivers, but really within the last you know couple of weeks, couple of months, and over the summer period, we're really seeing this you know the impacts of the shortage of drivers. And I think it's important to stress with all of these stories that yes, the he headlines look particularly alarming. Um, you know, there's there's fears of shortages of food, of fuel, but actually, um, you know, it, we haven't got to a situation where there's widespread shortages at the moment. But a lot of these companies are warning that potentially there is a crisis looming, and I think this is a situation that the government really needs to get to grips with and communicate, you know, an atmosphere of calm to the public mm -hmm. because it's certainly not, you know, reassuring to be looking at some of these headlines and thinking, oh my goodness, will I be able to get petrol? Will I be able to get food? So I do think it's something that the government is really going to need to control the narrative on. In the coming days. Yeah, when you see the words like fuel rationed, when you hear that petrol stations are being closed, it, it does uh, potentially lead to panic, Olivia, doesn't it? The government's message is don't do anything differently, buy your fuel as normal. But how concerned do you think Downing Street are about this situation? I think the problem is that sort of taken on its own, it's true that this fuel crisis doesn't yet at least seem to be a crisis. There are a few garages which have had to close, um, but the Downing Street message, which I'm, I'm sure is, is, is true and accurate, is that is that there is enough fuel in the UK. We're not facing a, a, a shortage. You might have to drive a little bit further. That's all. The problem is that sort of taken against the backdrop of everything else that we've got going on, obviously the furlough scheme is winding up in the next couple of weeks. Um, we've seen the price of wholesale gas you know, saw recently, which is putting up energy prices for ordinary people. Then you've got the national insurance hike, a problem with the government's own making, um, which is really going to hit people's wallets very hard. And there's this whole problem, which feels like it's emerging of a, of a winter of discontent. And on top of that, having there's you might not be able to get fuel in your car when you're driving uh it, it it does it does feel a little bit panicky. It does feel a bit back to the 70s vibe. Yeah, the, the Telegraph is talking of that uh, winter of discontent at looming, uh, Jasmine, energy companies going bust, uh, shortages on supermarket shelves in the run-up to Christmas, and, of course, uh, the uh, uh, petrol stations having to close down. Uh, what can be done about it? How can people be reassured? What does the government need to do now? I mean, I think there are, you know, multiple angles to really tackle this crisis. 
And I think, you know, for, for one, I think there needs to be you know, public messaging. It's been quite a difficult week on this front because obviously Johnson's been away in New York and he's been trying to push the climate agenda. Meanwhile, his ministers back at home are trying to reassure people that there's going to be enough food and fuel. So I think certainly getting the messaging right in terms of, you know, increasing the number of drivers, I do think more can be done from the government in that area. So they've said that they are, they're extending the hours that drivers can be on the roads. They're extending, um, you know, te testing for drivers so we can get more drivers trained up. But, you know, there is more that can be done to make that sector more lucrative in terms of, you know, offering higher wages and offering, you know, incentive packages to get people to join that sector. So we're tackling that issue. And I do think, you know, we do need to be looking at, um, obviously, the government has got its net zero um, goals, and, and that is important. But in the meantime, as we're sort of making that tr transition to renewables, we need to be looking at our current energy supplies and recognising that, yes, we are still reliant on things like gas, and we need to make Make sure that in the meantime we've got good we've got good supplies that we're not in the situation again yeah um let's have a look then olivia at the guardian again that story leading on the front of the guardian warning of fuel shortages amid supply chain crisis the lorry driver situation uh, and uh, the prime minister's spokesperson saying trying to reassure saying there's no shortage of fuel we have a very resilient and robust supply chain olivia but it doesn't seem very robust when you look at the situation we're in right now it doesn't seem very robust at all and we have heard this before about the uk supply chain um you know a couple of weeks ago we had to fire up a coal station again because it turned out that our wind supply wasn't nearly good enough there was a time a couple of weeks ago where wind farms which are supposed to provide 20 percent of the uk energy was only providing three percent of the uk energy so we do have quite a lot of big supply chain issues and i agree with jasmine that quite a lot of the problem is that we, the government's been quite idealistic about uh, the net zero targets, which, you know, very admirable. But the government's been quite idealistic and said, this is the, these are the renewables that we'll be using to generate our energy. And when they don't really work, there doesn't seem to be a plan B. We're very, very reliant on energy from Europe. We're reliant on energy from Russia. Um, and that's put us in a very precarious position and puts us at the mercy of, of lots of other countries, which isn't great. So I think there needs to be some serious thinking, and, it, and it's not a short-term solution at all, but there needs to be some serious thinking about getting a, a proper UK energy market going again and, and not just kind of try and plaster over the cracks with, with importing in, importing energy in um, from, from our neighbours. So I think that's a sort of long-term way of looking at it. And then sh shorter term, I completely agree that there need to be better incentives for, for HGV drivers. The average age of an HGV driver is 55. They're all retiring. No, no more have been trained up during lockdown. I think a simple recruitment drive would help. Um, I, I don't know... Very few people seem to know very much about becoming an HGV driver, so that could be part of it. Um, but but there are quite a few more things I think the government could be doing, both both in the short term and the long term. Yeah, uh, the the metro inside the metro has a, a pretty stark image of the uh, BP tankers all lined up at an oil terminal. Um, I think I heard a statistic today, Jasmine, that only one percent of HGV drivers are women. Mm. I mean, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. I mean, I think, you know, Olivia's right in the sense that we don't really know much about this sector. It's long hours, it's pretty low pay, it's quite gruelling, it's quite demanding. But we I now know how important it is, don't we? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's one of those things where, you know, we take it for granted that we can go to the stores and we can find whatever we want, that we can go to the petrol stations and we'll be able to get our petrol at a decent price. And actually, the past few weeks have shown that actually, you know, the supply chains and the very systems that are put in place to make our lives easier, they're actually quite fragile. And if we don't have a proper investment in, you know, in, in workers for these sectors and making sure that people are paid correctly and making sure that we've secured up our supply chains, actually, the ripple effects can be felt. And I do think that this is going to be a huge problem for the government because this is bread and butter stuff. If you go into the supermarket and you can't find what you want, if you go to a petrol station and you can't get what you need, you feel that instantly and it doesn't really inspire confidence that you've got a government that is improving your quality of life. And I think it's very significant in the context of levelling up. This is a government that's promised to, you know, boost equality across the country. And that isn't really compatible with rising, with rising bills and shortages. Olivia, let's move to the other story, which is across the, many of the front pages, and that is the story of Sabina Nessa, the teacher who was found dead, uh, killed just a short distance from her home, the front of the metro, uh, with the headline that a 38-year-old man has been held. Um, 
This is a story just six months after the death of Sarah Everard that has prompted that debate over women's safety yet again. And what has changed in that time? Despite that outcry, Olivia, six months ago, what has changed? What has been done? It feels like very little has been done at all. It, it was it was so odd after Sarah Everard uh, incident, the way it turned into some sort of strange uh, war with the police there was that vigil and and it just instead of instead of anyone sort of trying to grab the grab the nettle it was just it turned into a kind of clash between women and the police which was absolutely bizarre and so nothing seems to have been done and now we're in the same horrible situation again um she was just out for a walk she actually lives just down the road from me um and it's it's a really scary horrible thought uh and and i think it's going to it's sort of been a little bit slow to slow to build as, as a news story i think because the police knew so little at the beginning when it when the when the details sort of first emerged it's taken a while to come through but now an arrest has been made, I think it's going to sort of fire up the public imagination again. And I think we're going to see the same sort of outpouring of anger as we saw six months ago. She was killed on the same day that Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary released its report, Jasmine, on the epidemic of violence against women and girls. There is now a call for violence against women to be prioritised in the same way as, as terrorism is. Do you feel that, that there are moves in that direction? I mean, certainly there is a growing sense that, you know, more can be done on this. Certainly when, you know, we heard the tragic case of Sarah Everard, there was, you know, as Olivia was saying, there was, a, there was a real sense of anger and a sense, you know, and a desire to sort of change laws and to really act on this issue. But it sort of feels like the progress has been pretty slow. Like I remember a few months ago, we were talking about making misogyny a crime. Mm. We were talking about, um, the government was talking about more money for street lighting to make it brighter when women walk down the road, all these sort of incentives. And it doesn't really seem to have made a difference in the past few months. And I do think, you know, it's all well and good having tough rhetoric from the government on this issue. But I think more needs to be done to make sure that, you know, people and women in particular feel as though, you know, when they're walking home, they can, they're going to be safe and they're not going to be attacked and feel as though that when they report these instances to the police, that actually it's going to be handled in a sensitive and rig rigorous manner. Because even, you know, we know when it comes to things like sexual assault or rapes, you know, when it comes to, looking at the legal system, the, the system when it comes to convictions are pretty, pretty low. So there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, we are going to turn to the Telegraph, uh, Olivia, now, the front of the business section of the Telegraph. Um, Covid killing letters, said Royal Mail. So we sent fewer letters during the pandemic, apparently. Yes, we did. I mean, it's, I'm not sure if how to what extent that it's a pandemic effect or just that letters are, are sort of slowly but surely dying out. We've kind of seen the Royal Mail become a pack packaging service, really. Um, it deals in packages far more than letters, and it hasn't quite got the hang of that yet. Obviously, we saw lots of problems during the pandemic of people complaining that Amazon would get their product to them in less than 24 hours, and yet Royal Mail, it took days and days and days. So I think Royal Mail is still kind of catching up with this big shift that we're seeing away from letters and, and towards packages. Um, it's It's... It seems quite sad that that, that that letters were on the on the decline during the pandemic. I think I could have done with a few more letters dur during lockdown. I, I, I but thought I the think same. It's... Yeah, I thought the same that perhaps we might have had more time to communicate with people. But maybe we were all on on Zoom or Skype with people. Um, but uh, Jasmine, Royal Mail shares were down at uh, 120 pence 18 months ago. But given the prominence of parcels, the role it has played with our online deliveries, particularly during the pandemic, now tra trading at four times that. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think it is right in the sense that, you know, we've seen throughout the pandemic, it, it has sort of struggled um, to keep up with demand. Mm. But effectively, this is an organisation that it's, you know, it's an institution that we all have come to know and recognise and love. And, and hopefully there is still a space for it, even among the, the Amazons and the tech giants of the world. And I do definitely think that, you know, it's almost slightly counterproductive, counterintuitive, because you would have thought that during the pandemic, we all would have been writing letters furiously and, you know, we would have been communicating in sort of the maybe slightly more old fashioned ways. But, you know, I, I think it's it's part of a longer term trend in, in, in that regards and perhaps letter writing might become sadly a thing of the past.
Yeah, Royal Mail now mulling on a, on a five-day-a-week uh, letter service, dropping the Saturday uh, letter drops, but potentially a seven-day-a-week parcel delivery service. Um, let's move to our last story, and that is also in The Telegraph, page one of The Telegraph, uh, Olivia, and this is uh, about a Facebook executive. Uh, what can you tell us? Yeah, I thought it was quite interesting. So it's a Facebook executive who's had to apologise for making a comment that if someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools, then I'm not quite sure what it's, he said, but it's something along the lines that it's not Facebook's problem. Um, and he said that in 2016, five five years ago. And I think it's quite interesting the way we're sort of that was that was a sort of line that quite a lot of these big tech uh, execs used. You know that that we're we're a we're a platform. we we'll, people can do what they want on our platform. We're just there to provide the technology to let people communicate. Um, but we've seen over the last sort of five or six years that argument kind of falling apart. You know we've got um, people blaming Instagram for 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 an increase in child self harm, for example. Um, and these these big tech platforms are sort of having to admit that they're not just platforms to some extent, their publishers. And obviously that starts to interfere um, with their business model. Once, once, you're, once, once you're saying that, that there is, a, you know, we as the big tech company have, a, have some sort of responsibility for what's being posted on our platforms, then it's much, much, much more difficult to, to have this model where there are millions of people shouting out into the ether all the time and, and you don't moderate it. So I just think it's quite an interesting shift that we've seen um, in, not, in not very many years that, that this Facebook exec is now having to apologise for that comment made just five years ago. OK, uh, Olivia and Jasmine, for now, thank you very much indeed.